that is to be surrounded by six angelic young women. Gracious God, our Father, we come before you to pray and praise you this day, to thank you, thank you for your son Jesus Christ that you sent. Oh, Lord, what great tidings of, of great joy as you sent your son to save us, Lord, and we look forward to your second coming. Lord, we thank you for this congregation, for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us, and we pray that thy spirit will be with us this day as we worship thee in peace and in truth. Oh, let us rejoice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. of years, God had been making promises to his people. He had promised a prince, a shepherd, a healer, a conqueror, a prophet, and a priest, a lion, and a lamb. He had promised peace. He had promised freedom. He had promised love and life without end. Finally, one evening, in the blackness of night, his promises all came wrapped together as one magnificent promise. The promise was a baby. The promise was Emmanuel. The, the promise, promise was, was God, God himself.
Christmas is a story of joy. It's a story of wonder, of magnificent promises made and kept. It's a story of faith, of love and light and worship. A story of long journeys and incredible discoveries. It's a story of kings and angels, of shepherds and priests, of young and old. It's a story of beautiful, ordinary people. But above all, Christmas is a story of Jesus. When we sing at Christmas, we sing about him. When we celebrate, we celebrate him. Christmas is a story of love. For hundreds of years, love had whispered, I am coming. I am coming to be with you, to stay with you forever. It was love that was celebrated that night in the skies over Bethlehem with angels, music, and shouts of praise. Love was the shining star high in the sky, sent to draw people from far away to come and worship the baby.
Christmas is a story of faith. It's a story of hardship and sacrifice, of long journeys and years of waiting. Mary, perhaps 14 years old, endured the terrible shame of being pregnant before she was married. After traveling 80 miles to Bethlehem, no doubt exhausted and frightened, far from family and home, she had her first child in the dirt and darkness of a stable. Joseph stayed by her side, though the child was not his own. He willingly shared her shame and her suffering. Mary, Joseph, and many others followed God through long, difficult days. But because they were faithful, they rejoiced in him and became part of his timeless story. a story of worship. The scriptures say, the heavens sing of God's glory, and the earth tells of the wonderful things he does. Jesus said that if God's people are silent, the rocks themselves will cry out and praise him. 
When the shepherds heard that the promised one had come, neither distance nor darkness could keep them away. They ran through the night to Bethlehem. When they found the child, they fell down and worshiped him. How could they do anything else? Then they returned, glorifying and praising God. They couldn't help sharing the amazing news with everyone they met. A tiny, crying, cute little baby. Instead of diapers, he was wrapped tightly in swaddling clothes, strips of cloth to keep his limbs warm and straight. Instead of a cradle, he was laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. He had no other place to sleep. Why would God leave the beauty, the peace, and the happiness of heaven to become a poor, weak, helpless infant? Why would he lay aside the glory of all he was and take upon himself the simplicity of a child? He came to be close to us, to touch us, to become like us, so that we could become like him. He came because he loved us.
One more thing that we worked on. Each of the kids wanted to share a gift that they wanted to give Jesus this Christmas. Okay. Kavanaugh's first. My heart. Oh, more love. My heart. Listen to my mom. Pray. Take t take care of people. My heart. My heart. My heart. Happy Sabbath. Um, for those of us uh, who are able, please kneel. We're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath day. 
this Sabbath day in particular, Lord God, we got to witness some, witness some awesome worshiping, Lord God. The music was beautiful. The, si the choir sang really great, Lord God. It was inspiring and touching. Um, thank you, Lord, for the young ladies that performed today, too. They were, they were awesome. Their bells were really beautiful when I played them. And thank you for this, uh, the younger generation, the smaller kids, Lord God. Um, it was cute and adorable, Lord. We appreciate that, and we know uh, you appreciate that, too, Lord. Please be with us uh, this holiday season, Lord God. Christmas sometimes can be stressful for some people, Lord. Other times, for other people, it can be great. Like for me and my family, we love Christmas. It's our favorite time of the year, Lord. It's a time where we can uh, be more giving and more open to showing warmth to people we might necessarily not show warmth to, Lord God. Please help us have more of that, Lord God. Um, we have special prayers for Ruby Ferguson, Nancy Speaks, and John Woodbury, Lord God. Please help the church remember them in our prayers, and please be with all our unspoken requests, Lord God. Please be with the younger generation that just got through singing, Lord. Please help them listen to your Holy Spirit when it speaks to them, when he says go, that they go, when it says listen, that they listen, and when, it, when the Holy Spirit says be happy, that they be happy, Lord God. We love you so much, and we thank you, Lord, for sending your only begotten to come save us, Lord God to show what love is, not only to the human race, but to all existence to the universe, Lord God. Um, we love you so much. Please uh, help us not squander our time on this planet. Help us to be thankful and help us be strong. You, are, you got our backs no matter what, Lord God. And we want to see more people in heaven. Um, we love you so much. Thank you for being truly kind, caring, and all powerful. Please help us listen to the Holy Spirit and please uh, be with Pastor Dave when he gives this sermon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> oh, that was fun. I saw some of those kids in their uh, in their packages. They looked a little bit more like they were in the stocks. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were trying to smile. They were they were beautiful, wonderful. Love this time of year. Love the songs. Love uh, all of the things that we do. And boy, do I appreciate, you know, everyone who uh, helps with this. Jim, for the music on the piano, thank you so much. I uh, just appreciate what you do. And Winda leading the choir, all the choir members. Now, uh, a lot of our choir did have to leave early, just so you know, because they are performing at the prison. Um, so we won't have as many up on the stage uh, for our final uh, song together, uh, but we know that they are uh, um, doing a good thing, uh, singing to those uh, at the jail. So uh, just be aware of that. Love the kids and the bells, and uh, just appreciate everyone for doing their part for this service. Well, I don't know how many of our, our kids are left because they are probably still getting uh, changed. But I do just have a, a very, very small quiz. I, I just have to. It's just my pattern. I just love to, uh, to engage with the, the young people a little bit. So I'm just going to ask a question. If you're a kid, I want your help. Who in the Bible saw Jesus as a baby? Who in the Bible saw Jesus as a baby? And it's kind of, it's kind of groups, actually. It's kind of five groups. Bailey. The kings. Uh, the kings, the magi. That's right. Matthew tells us about these uh, wise men from the east. Oh, Peyton, you got up there already. Peyton, how many of you enjoyed her singing? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you so much, Peyton. Go ahead. Bailey said the, uh, the wise men. What do you say? That's right. And those are the ones we think of. Those are the, the big ones in the nativity scene. You know, the shepherds, absolutely right. The wise men. Who else saw Jesus as a baby? And, of course, many did. But who does the Bible uh, talk to us about specifically? Who else saw Jesus as a baby? Now, one of these is so obvious you might overlook it. I want the kids here. Any of the kids? Caleb? That's right. His parents, Mary and Joseph. 
Absolutely. I heard some of the other people mention a couple others. Yeah, I know. Carlos, you're so helpful. <laughs> Just appreciate you. <laughs> Sam, I'm not calling on you. I know you. I know what you'll say. All right, Sam, what? The animals. Maybe, maybe so. <laughs> oh, yeah, hey, buddy. The angels, absolutely. Good to see you. And then there's one other that we might not think about. I call them the people at the temple. Who was at the temple when Jesus was being dedicated? There's a couple of individuals that are mentioned. Emma. Yeah, his mom and dad. I think Caleb said that one. But that's, that's right. That's good. Two individuals, only known in uh, the, the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 2, Jesus is being brought to the temple. He's being dedicated on the eighth day, as was their custom. And two individuals saw baby Jesus and were impressed by that. Now, I'll let you guys argue it out. I'm going to move to this side. Any of you adults? Maria? Simeon, yes, a devout and righteous man by the name of Simeon who's advanced in years, who had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit revealed to him that the baby Jesus was the Messiah. And he, he took up a, a, a praise song and took, it almost sounds like he grabbed Jesus out of their arms when you read it. It says, and taking up the child. It's like, what are you doing with my baby? No, no. The Holy Spirit has revealed to me that this is the Messiah. Simeon, and then there's one other person. Anna, Anna a prophet, is there actually Hannah, Anna or Hannah, I kind of like to think of her as Hannah because of the Old Testament uh, story, but she was a prophetess advanced in years, and she too witnessed uh, that Jesus was the Messiah and rejoiced about that, and um, yeah, and there could have been more, uh, clearly there were more, but the Bible doesn't mention any others that identified that they were actually seeing the Messiah. Did we mention the angels? Good. Good. The story comes to us in Luke chapter 2. Where the Christmas story is it sometimes called. I'm going to begin in, in verse 7, though, of Luke chapter 2 to read... The story, and, and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation because I, I like how they put it. It says that Mary gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the radiance of the Lord's glory, the radiance of the Lord's glory, surrounded them and they were terrified but the angel reassured them don't be afraid he said i bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people the savior even the messiah the lord has been born today in bethlehem the city of david and you will recognize him by this sign now the angel never says you need to go to bethlehem but I think that the Lord knew that the shepherds would make that decision. You will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in snuggling, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger, in a manger. And that must have been interesting for the shepherds to hear that. You know, we've romanticized the manger as that beautiful little cradle. When they heard the manger, they heard feeding trough. You will find the Messiah wrapped up snugly, and he's going to be lying in a feeding trough. What? That's what the angel said. Lying in a manger. Verse 13. Suddenly, this single angel, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. The armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in, in the highest heaven. Peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem. What do you say? Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried 
to the village. They found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the, the manger, the feeding trough. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and, that the, and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. So there he was. Jesus. A little baby lying there in an animal's feeding trough. Is it okay if I call it that? <laughs> Straw was used for padding, a small blanket for warmth, and there the exhausted child slept. Mary and Joseph gazed and marveled at what had just happened. There in the manger was the very incarnation of God. Emmanuel had come. And while he was beautiful and healthy, while he was handsome and strong, he did not look any different than any other newborn child. There was nothing unusual about him. No special glow illumined him. No matter what you see in artist painting, and in stories. There was no birthmark or physical excellence indicating that this was the king. Nothing about him made him look divine. He was a baby. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament had stated this. Isaiah had prophesied that he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He did not glow. He was not larger or taller or ha more handsome than your run-of-the-mill baby boy. And while angels had spoken to Mary and Joseph at the time of his appearance, or excuse me, at the time of his conception, and now the angels had now come to the shepherds uh, in, in the fields at night, they're now in the stable. There were no angels that we're aware of that appeared to Mary and Joseph. There was no glorified welcome, no, no heavenly music to declare him Lord. No angel came to Mary and Joseph that night in a glorious revelation. There was no blowing of trumpets, no anxious masses to welcome the child, no marching bands, no heralds proclaiming, Behold your king! Behold, the Messiah has been born. That was what you would typically do when a, a, a king had a child or when a, a, a king had been born. There would be a herald going throughout the whole city proclaiming, Rejoice, the king has been born. No. There was only the baying of sheep, the gentle lowing of cows, and the occasional eeyore or brain of a donkey. At least that's what the nativity scene generally has. The Bible doesn't say that. But why not? Thus Joseph and Mary wondered after the child in relative silence and solitude. Well, as the night drew on, they began to hear the soft footfall of, footfall of people approaching, and they heard, they heard the uh, hurried and hushed voices of Bedouin shepherds. And they came and explained their heavenly visions. They fell to their knees. They worshiped the child there as he lay in the manger, and they, like his parents, marveled at the Messiah, the anointed Savior. With joy and excitement, they went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Sometime later, a unique and unusual star would guide magi from the east, these, these gentle and wise seekers, to also visit the child. They too would fall down and worship the child. That's what the Gospel of Matthew says. All who came to the infant Christ and understood the miracle of the manifestation of God in flesh were overwhelmed at the sight and were thankful to worship and adore him. The first selected messages. It says, the humanity of the Son of Man is everything to us. The humanity of the Son of Man is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. 
Christ was a real man. He gave, he gave proof of his humility in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we do well to heed the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush, put off thy shoes from thy feet, from the place which you stand is holy ground. We should come to this study with humility of a learner, with a contrite heart. And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. Page 244. With humility and a contrite heart, put off thy shoes from thy feet. Whenever you study the incarnation of God, it is a holy thing to consider. And surely every student of the Bible has at one time or another contemplated the birth of Christ from the perspective of his parents. Remember, Joseph was not the father. He looked at Christ as one who would adopt the baby Jesus. And I'm sure you've thought about that before. What it must have been like for Mary to look upon that child and realize that she had never been with a man. That this was something of God. And for Joseph, who'd been told in a dream that this was the Messiah, to look upon that child and realize who he must have been. Surely you've thought about it from the shepherd's perspective. Who would uh, get the vision from the angels and come rushing to Bethlehem. Surely you've thought about it from the wise men's perspective, the magi, these, these Gentiles from the east. Babylonians probably, we don't know but who had come to understand from the scriptures that the Lord had been born. But the one that fascinates me really the most when I think about the event of the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem is the perspective of the angels. The perspective of the holy, unfallen angels in heaven and how they looked upon Jesus at that time. You thought about that one before? I'm sure you have. Scripture does not make a lot of mentions of this, and yet it doesn't ignore it either. Uh, one of the passages comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Paul says, By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit seen by angels, he says, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Paul says part of the mystery of godliness, part of the plan of salvation, part of the power of what God has done for us is that Jesus was seen by angels. It is part of the plan of salvation. It's that angels have been witnesses to Christ's condescension. Another passage in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, it says they, meaning the Old Testament prophets, were told that their messages were not for themselves but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels eagerly desire to look into it. You read that one before? Even the angels, Peter says, have great interest in the Messiah. Do you think the angels care about what happens here on earth? I mean, after all, they're, they're, just, they're still in their glorified perfection. They just live up there on clouds strumming harps all day. They don't care about anything that happens on earth, do they? Is that what the Bible teaches? Can you imagine just for a moment what they were thinking when they looked into the manger? Sometimes we get the idea that angels are kind of stoic and passive, apathetic and emotionless. In artwork and sculptures and stories and songs, angels, while involved and helpful in the affairs of God, are often depicted as demure and reserved, kind of uh, aloof, separated from, from the things of earth. Smiles on their faces, yes, wings outspread, hands open to assist, but somehow not affected by God's actions and activities on earth. But I believe that's an error in our thinking and part of the vestige of classical religion that thought that divine beings couldn't possibly be interested in us. In early writings, it says, Angels were so interested for man's salvation that there could be found among them those who would yield their glory and give their life for perishing man. Have you ever read that before? 
They were, they were found among them those who would yield their glory and give their life for man. So interested in this planet and in the uh, effects that sin had wrought in our world. But the transgression was so great that an angel's life would not pay the debt. Nothing but the death of the intercession of God's Son would pay the debt and save lost man from the hopeless sorrow and misery. I believe that as angels gazed at Jesus, they were the most awestruck and amazed beings in all of creation. Now, they had witnessed the condescension of Christ before this time. The pre-incarnate Christ had appeared to Adam and Eve in the garden. He'd walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve before the fall. We read about that in the book of Genesis. God had appeared to Moses and the elders of Israel, to Joshua, to the pagan monarch named Nebuchadnezzar. Christ appeared to him. And to Isaiah and many of the prophets. They had seen Christ bring himself down from his glorious position before. He'd done it before. He had walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, as I mentioned. Moses uh, amazingly asked to see God. You remember that? In the book of Exodus, God asks, or excuse me, Moses asks, I want to see you, God. Show me your glory. What a bold request. And I honestly, to this day, I cannot tell you if whether or not it was out of ignorance or arrogance that Moses asked the question. Show me your glory. And the revelation was so, of the glory of God was so powerful that you remember that the face of Moses shined so bright that he had to veil himself in order to communicate with the children of Israel because of his interaction with God. Christ came to Joshua at Jericho as a powerful captain of armies with sword drawn and promising victory over Israel's enemies. Angels had watched the pre-incarnate Christ save the three Hebrews from the fiery furnace and then reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar while in the midst of the fire. Remember that, by the way, on our Tuesday night Bible study? We're getting right into uh, Daniel chapter 3. But can you imagine? There was no need for Jesus to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't have to do it. He could have just saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar could have looked in there and said, What's going on? There are three guys in there and they're not burning up. But Christ specifically appeared so that Nebuchadnezzar would see in the midst of the flames, there are not three men that I see, but four. And one looks like the Son of God. Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. He was so overwhelmed by the vision of God in the temple in Isaiah chapter 6 that he cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I cannot live now. So powerful was the vision of the pre-incarnate Christ. And all of these envisions and encounters were with Christ. God the Father is spirit, Jesus teaches us in John 4, 24. It was Christ who came to, to intercede for fallen humanity. Christ was the one who would descend to mankind. It was Christ who would stoop low and constrict his glory let it lest it consume mankind. Right was Isaiah to declare, woe is me. Woe is me. And Moses, we come back to the story of Moses after he asked to see God. Remember what God said to Moses? He, it's almost like he said to Moses, you don't know what you're asking. Do you understand? No man can see me and live. No man can see my face. It would overwhelm you. It would consume you. It would destroy you. So grand, so glorious, so powerful is my being. But for this moment, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand. I'll pass by, and, and you'll be able to see me from, from my back. And so powerful was that revelation that Moses' face shined brightly so that the sons of Israel had to say, Whoa, cover your face, Moses. We are just overwhelmed by the light coming from you. That was Christ. That was Christ. That was Jesus. Angels had seen the pre-incarnate Christ appear to man. From man's perspective, Christ would always be tall, always be majestic, always powerful, always overwhelming and immortal and infinite. Moses and the elders saw the feet of God. Have you read that before in Exodus 24? They just got to see it. They couldn't raise their eyes any higher. All they saw was his feet standing on a blue pavement. And it was overwhelming. It was powerful. 
from man's perspective, even the pre-incarnate Christ was an overwhelming experience. But from an angel's perspective, even those appearances of Jesus were an enormous condescension of his true nature and being. Are you with me? Yeah. Howard's with me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. They were enormous restrictions to Christ's true and unshielded nature. Remember the glory. Think about this. The glory of one angel at the time of the resurrection. One angel was bright enough, powerful enough, strong enough that a hundred of the bravest Roman soldiers fell on the ground like dead men. They couldn't handle it. That was from one angel. How much more glory does God have than an angel? How much more? Think about how much he had to restrict his glory even in those Old Testament appearances. How much he had to shield his power and his nature and his character. And yet, even still, from the perspective of angels, even those appearances were enormous, humbling visions of the true God. How much more glory of, does God have than that of an angel? How much more awesome is God than this? Solomon said that heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain God. In 1 Kings chapter 8, he says, all of heaven can't even contain you, God. You are so massive. Isaiah said that the hand of God measures, he measures the heavens with the span of his hand. You read that before? Isaiah chapter 40. You know how big the universe is? A any of you like science and astronomy? 15 billion light years is the latest that I've heard. 15 billion light years. If you were to stand at one end of the universe and start walking, okay? It'd take you 15 billion light years until you got to the other end of the universe and said, okay, there it is, 15 billion. The Bible says that God measures that with the span of his head. Yep, one, two, yeah, about three, three or so, maybe four. Job says he stretches out the night sky, and he hung the world on nothing. David in the Psalms says that he breathed the heavenly hosts into existence. God, breathe. The those are the stars. Stars, right? Louis Giglio likes to call God the star breather. He breathed the stars. How big are stars? How powerful are stars? And God just said, I want there to be more. I'm going to give some more stars. And out of his mouth came the stars. This is the God that was now lying in a manger. What did the angels see? What did they see? Can you imagine as they tried to wrap their minds around that concept? The same God who measures the heavens with the span of his hand. The same God who speaks the stars into existence. The same God who, who fills the entire heavens is now wrapped up as a weak and helpless infant lying in a manger. Can you possibly conceive what that would have been like for them? The kind of God the angels were used to. They had never seen anything like this before. This is the God they worshipped and adored and served. Hebrews says that God made the world through Jesus Christ and that Jesus is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, upholds all things by the word of his power. All the angels knew how big, how powerful, how holy, how magnificent God is, but yet there he was. There he was. He was an infant, a simple, vulnerable, destitute, exposed, and pooped infant. And yes, pun intended. He became a man. He became a baby. The word humble does not begin to sufficiently describe this God that we serve. It doesn't measure up. Meek, lowly, selfless, generous, sacrificial, all of these words fail. They can't adequately describe the story of the manger. 
And really, in my opinion, only one word comes close. Only one word can begin to open our minds to what God has truly done for us. And it's simply the word love. In some small, some delicate way, only love can begin to describe what God did for us. This was the grandest act of love the universe had ever seen. And it was just the beginning. It was just the beginning. Greater manifestations of love are yet to come, and they would culminate with the cross. John says in 1 John 4.10, This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that we then, that one laid down his life for his sin. So, there he was. There he was. Asleep in the manger, seen by angels and only a few others, but I believe the angels gathered. Unseen and unacknowledged, they massed toward this earth. How many angels are there anyways? Somewhere between 25 and 50? Yeah, about that many. Yep, yep. How many angels? How many of them were interested in the manger? How many of them wanted to see it? How filled was Bethlehem? Although Mary and Joseph may not have seen it, the shepherds may not have seen them all. Jerusalem missed out on it. How many angels massed toward that stable to see this miracle of God becoming man? They pressed in, filling the skies in numbers innumerable, innumerable in amazement and joy, in astonishment and elation. They strained to see the boy. Satan and his angels fled. For a brief moment, there was no place for them. A small band of angels were permitted to be revealed to the shepherds. And then in one great and glorious exultation, every divine and holy being cried out in that first Christmas song, singing, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Back and forth, the song echoed, glory to God in the highest, glory to God, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Over and over again they sing. Higher and higher it went. Louder and louder it went. And it was more than a song. It was truth. It wasn't like they had rehearsed. It wasn't like it was something they were reciting. It wasn't like something they had practiced. So perfect, so true, so noble was what they just saw that it almost came out of them compulsory. It was almost involuntary, like they couldn't contain themselves. And the only words that were sufficient, the only thing that would make sense, the only thing that was appropriate for that was glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Look what God has done for mankind. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. Almost like how the Bible says that in the last day, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept him as Lord or not, when he reveals himself on that last, last day, every being on earth will fall to their knees and call him Lord. Not because all beings believe it, not because all beings accept it, but at the revelation of Jesus Christ's true character, at the glorification of his being, even those who reject him will be compelled to speak out the truth for which they are now seeing. And I imagine the angels being of that same mind. So powerful was the birth of Jesus. The coming up out of them was the declaration, glory to God. Glory to God. What God has done for mankind. It was natural. It was true. There he was. God had become man. Divinity had become flesh. I can't explain it. There's no logic. There's no science. There's no reason to talk about how God, who fills the universe, would, would able to conden condense himself. And that's why, that's why Ellen White says, take off your shoes as you contemplate the coming of Jesus. This is a holy, a holy subject. 
It will be the science of our study throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. He became one with man. And it wasn't temporary. It wasn't just for a moment. He didn't just become man for a few years on earth. His character was forever and eternally changed. Jesus Christ is one with us today. Today. Jesus Christ is one with us. He came out of the tomb glorified, yes. He, 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 he was now shining in what mankind should look like, what Adam looked like when he was first created. Surely he was glorified, but he was still man. Forever and eternity, he did it. And he did it for you. All of you. No one is left out. Well, he did it for some, but not for me. No. No. He did it for you. Your name was on his heart. God is infinite. He is omnipotent, omniscient. He has the ability to know every single soul down to the number of hairs on your head. He did it for you. And every soul willing to worship, willing to believe, willing to accept Christ, willing to repent from sin and turn from the evil that's destroying you. You are invited into God's family. One of the greatest stories ever written about Jesus is the desire of ages. And I love how it closes out one of the chapters. It says the story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless theme. In it is hidden the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the manger and the companionship of adoring angels for the beasts of the stall. Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence. Yet this was but the beginning of his wonderful condescension. The heart of the human father yearns over his son, the human father looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought of the life's peril. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, to hold him back from temptation and conflict. To meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk, God gave his only begotten son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones. Herein, she says, is love. Herein is love. Wonder, O oh heavens, and be astonished, O oh earth. I hope that this Christmas season you will remember the manger and it will be more than just a decoration. It is for everyone. God's great gift is given to each of us and to all of us. Jesus is God's gift of life, holy, full, unending life. Jesus is God's gift of peace, filling each heart and mind. Jesus is God's gift of love, love that enfolds us, lifts us, and transforms our world into the heaven he intended it to be. Praise God for his gift of Christmas. Praise, Praise God, God for, for Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ.
our God, once more we dedicate our hearts to you. Lord, we cannot begin. We cannot truly begin to understand all of what you have done for us. But one thing is completely, completely clear, Lord, is that, that you love us more than we can ever fathom. You love us. In you, we understand what love is. Father, bless us this day. May this be a wonderful time of rejoicing and rest and fellowship. And our Lord Jesus, I pray that we would all have a very Merry Christmas. In Jesus' name.